it's terrible that it's happening, but in the midst of it, Mm -hmm. we can be a catalyst for good in a world of darkness. Uh, You've never been in a better position than you are right now to step up and to do something about the world that you see around you. The call to action here is we need to live the life that God intended us to live and live it to the fullest. Oh my goodness. There's no more time for this lackadaisical life. We can't be complacent anymore. You cannot afford to live a complacent Christian life. God is making up the difference, making up the difference for you because when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. It was that moment, I'll never forget it, that I realized, no, just because my parents go to church or whatever's going on, there has to be a personal, there has to be something that happens personally between me and Christ, between me and Christ. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Life and Faith Podcast. We're happy to have you with us. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about a recent event. Um, it may sound kind of political. Uh, that's never the chief end, what we desire here. It's, uh, there may be political elements to it, but what it really is, is it boils down to what are we dealing with in life? Because that's what this is about, it's life and faith. Yeah, how does, this, uh, how does this ancient word apply to today mm-hmm. to equip saints to contend with this world today, with the modern world? Because if, if you can't deal with real world problems and everything's all up here in the, uh, what do you call it? Like this, this uh, mystical like sense, like theoretical. You, yeah, the ethereal. You got to take it and apply it. Like, how does a person practically live this life? Yeah, so, that's, those those uh, truths of the word are all well and good, Josh. But what do you? But what does it mean to me living in this twenty first century internet world and all this stuff? You know, because you do hear that a lot, like people saying. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, this is the day that I live in and they didn't understand. They didn't have the cell phones and the internet and stuff like that. I've literally heard people say goofy stuff like that. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, how we handle situations in the modern day currently, you could essentially make the case that people can look back and learn from it and apply it even to, albeit it's probably very different scenarios hundred years from now, but mm-hmm. the root issues that they're dealing with are going to be the same yeah yeah no josh we are evolved yeah yeah we've we've exceeded we our, our forefathers yeah these problems these petty problems pre-internet problems yeah so what i'd like to talk about uh, and today at the time of recording this is january 27th of 2024 and i have been as we've been recording uh, various episodes today i've been checking the news to make sure i have up-to-date information on this Um, so I believe there's no real, uh, updates on this today as far as what I can see. But when I gather my notes, uh, I want to talk about the crisis at the border, which is taking place at specifically the Mexican, uh, United States border. And even more specific than that, what is happening with Texas, because the state of Texas, uh, or the governor rather has taken a stand, uh, which is kind of unprecedented. I believe there's been some other, I've kind of have some of this stuff in my notes and I'll probably get to that. So there's been some things similar to this, but nothing of this scale. Um, I want to always be careful when we talk about these things, especially current events, uh, because who knows, this could drastically change between now when we're recording this and when it, it it goes public to you all. Right. Um, But I want to be careful. Like I don't want to overblow this. But I also want to just uh, talk about it matter-of-factly. Uh, I know a lot of people are saying, um, and they're, re- they're sources that I trust, but I also take it with a grain of salt. And that is that this could be one of the greatest um, stories unfolding before us of our time. Uh, maybe worst-case scenario, you could say, could lead to some unprecedented things. It already is unprecedented but it could lead to even more unprecedented times. So essentially, if I could break it down here, um, it began with the governor of Texas, uh, Greg Abbott. He put up razor wire around the border. Specifically, I think it has to do with a specific park uh, on the border. Um, 
And so this is my knowledge of it. The razor wire was put up by the governor because the feds, he said, are not doing anything about it. Okay, so when you say a park, you mean like a, like a huge, not like a, uh, I guess what I'm asking is what is what is a park in the context of South Texas? So like a long stretch, miles and miles? Yes, like I'm talking about more like a, uh, oh, what do you call it? I guess a national park. Okay, I don't yeah, think it's necessarily a national park, but it's like that scale, like yeah, was, a state park. I was wondering what a park looks like at that part of the country. You know what I mean? Because you, what do you think park even up here? Yeah, probably not think, much green. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. But I, when I think about a park up here, uh, yeah, I would say like it would be in locations that were sort of contained, not necessarily stretching along a long border. It would be like there's parks like yes. there's Isle Royale way up north which is an island mm-hmm. but it other parks in in um in the state are um smaller more contained areas it doesn't go say the stretch of the entire state or the border of the state yeah i mean i'm not i haven't been to the area where it's talking about um i know it's in eagle pass texas and i know that uh recently on january 12th the texas military department seized and secured uh, what is known as Shelby Park, and there it's a uh, two and a half mile area. Um, so Texas authorities oh, okay. essentially effectively blocked uh, the U.S. Border Patrol agents, um, and it's right. Obviously, that's right along that line uh, between the United States and Mexico uh, on the Rio Grande, which is a lot of what that border is. Um, so I, I say it to put it in perspective for you, but really, what what we're talking about at large is a, a much greater problem than just that 2.5 mile section. Mm-hmm. There's a, there's a crisis along the entire border. <clears throat> and I will point out too, we don't have the same problem at the Canadian border because you got both sides of it trying to keep up the border and regulate, regulate it. So uh, we don't have a near the same problem on the Canadian border as we do the Mexican border. Um, but anyway, so what has transpired, I'm going to try to just give the cliff notes of this so we don't get too far into the weeds here, but um, uh, Governor Abbott tried to put up razor wire because he felt that the feds were not doing anything to prevent what was happening. Uh, just a stream of people. Like uh, uh, somebody watched, uh, There, there's recordings of it that you can see, like footage of people crossing in. And it is. it looks like what I would picture the children of Israel marching into uh, Canaan. Mm-hmm. It, it's just a massive, like millions of people. Somebody looked at it one time and said, uh, it kind of looks like the Boston Marathon. If you ever seen like those little tiny sections roped off for them to all walk through there or run right. through there. It's just that many people coming through. Um, so it's out there. You can look at those videos. But he, essentially, uh, Governor Abbott's trying to make a stand because it's a matter of not only... Uh, nation security but you know essentially that should be on the president's radar but he's saying okay if you're not going to do anything about it i am because i still have a state to protect and uh obviously there's four states that border the mexican border there's uh california arizona new mexico and texas but the texas strip of that alone uh accounts for 50 percent of that entire border um so just to put that in perspective for you the border patrol started cutting it down. They started coming in and cutting down the razor wire that Abbott uh, had just put up. So this resulted in Abbott drawing a line in the sand. He sued the border patrol. He, he filed a lawsuit. He's suing them. Uh, and, and I want to point this out too. Let me uh, go to my notes here. Um, he actually, it went to the Fifth Circuit Court. That court agreed and said that Governor Abbott was well within his right to be able to put up the razor wire and that the Border Patrol should not be taking it down. Um, obviously, Biden is uh, and, and the presidential um, administration, they are telling them to go ahead with it. Uh, go ahead and tear it down. Go ahead and tear it down. The DHS uh, appealed the Fifth Circuit, so then it went to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court said... Uh, it is an ongoing uh, court case. It has not been finished, and and frankly, 
it is my opinion that it's they're probably gonna it's probably gonna take a real long time. And um, but here's here's the pivotal point: the Supreme Court ruled already that and t- while this is pending, while the court case is pending, while the the lawsuit and everything is pending, the Border Patrol can continue cutting down the razor wire as long as the case is pending, which leaves it open ended because right. There's no promise or guarantee as to when that court will be decided. Now, he should, constitutionally, he should have a right to a, a speedy trial. That That's not going to happen, though, unfortunately, and it isn't happening uh, right before our eyes. Uh, so th- this, this punting of cases like this one right here is a common abuse of the legal system that we see. I could bring all kinds of examples here and, and probably on both sides of the political aisle of people punting things it doesn't make it right no matter what party is doing it um, but punting it further and further down the road just to buy more time to continue doing stuff like this this vote that I referenced earlier of the Supreme Court saying they can continue cutting while we decide it was a five to four vote so it barely passed mm-hmm. uh I'm I'm giving the full context here. I don't want to insinuate anything here, but uh, there was one guy on the Supreme Court that ruled in in favor of the the Border Patrol continuing to cut it down. The four other were women. One of these ladies was uh, Amy Comey Barrett, who, if you'll remember, years ago was in the news because everybody's like Trump should wait until there's a new president because it was like really close to the election, right? And he was saying they shouldn't put her in office and all that stuff. Well. They threw a fit over this lady, but yet the lady sided with all of the liberals in this one. Okay, I think I am confused. You're saying it's five to four. There's one guy who said keep cutting it down, and the other four were ladies. The other four were ladies saying, "Yep." So there's saying a saying cut it down. There's a five to four vote of the I five see. that said uh, continue cutting it down. That were, one of those was uh, Barrett. Was Trump's choice? Uh, Trump's, Trump's Trump's choice. Yeah, and. I've heard different people say this. Like I was even talking about this with my wife last night. Uh, who knows what is being said to this lady? Um, and I thought, you know, like, yeah, does that really happen and that kind of stuff? Uh, I was doing research for this. And in my research, I was listening to this segment of people talking about it. A completely unrelated segment after that was featuring, um, I can't remember the lady's name at the moment, but uh, I think she's running for Senate. But anyway, and there's even talks about her maybe being a potential vice president uh, candidate. Uh, but anyway, this lady specifically just came out and said 11 months ago, there was a Republican in her state that was trying to bribe her to not run and to wait until a certain time, offering her money. And it, it was like a bribe, but there was also an undertone of a threat that influential high up people do not want you to run right now. And they'd be very happy if you didn't run right now. And she ousted this this guy. And this guy was, yes, he was a Republican, and he stepped down from his position. I'm sorry that I'm not giving names to this, but I'm sure if you search something similar to yeah, this. Yeah, there's going to be people who understand all this stuff better than we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but but if you're, if you're one of those people like me last night when I was thinking through this and said, well, that could never happen. No, but, but, but I ran into... Uh, unintentionally an example where somebody was literally doing what I was thinking couldn't happen. And that was going and saying, we'll pay you this much money if you don't do this. Mm -hmm. And we're talking a quote unquote conservative. I don't believe this person is actually conservative, but that's, that's the mantra that they bear. (laughs) That's the the banner that they bear. Um, And, and they stepped down probably because of that. Um, but anyway, I, I kind of got in the weeds a little bit there, but there was a five to four vote in the Supreme Court. And and like I said, there should be a speedy trial, but it's it won't be. And so now you have this mandate that was, I believe, yesterday. So that would have been January 26th. Abbott was told you have until this date, and then we're going to go in and start cutting the razor wire again. Which I, I don't know anything about that, how the normal practice goes, but it stands to reason that usually when stuff is being decided then everything halts, right? Isn't that how it goes? It's like if you're building a building and you don't get the proper permits, they don't say, well, keep building the building while we sort this out. That's how it should be. That's Typically, it's like everything stops until they decide and then they decide where to go and then they start again, right? I thought that's how – I don't – again, not a lawyer. 
Not a, you know what I mean? Not a border patrol agent. Not any- From what I understand, it's uh, from what I've done research on this, it's a common abuse of the legal system of saying, we'll figure this out, but in the meantime, let's allow this to continue happening. Like, think about some really heinous crimes that you can think of. Like, I don't want to get gruesome or graphic on this, but just imagine, if you will, a heinous crime, you know, murder, things that are worse than murder, and say, we'll allow this to continue until we decide what to do with this person. Like, that would never fly. But because you've got this kind of issue here, um, that that's what's taking place. I want to I want to get a little bit into this as to what the governor stated, because uh, he really, like, this gives you uh, Declaration of Independence vibes as to what the governor wrote. Um, and he said... Uh, Let me try to get to just the the good parts here. He said, despite having been put on notice in a series of letters, one of which I delivered to him by hand, President Biden has ignored Texas's demand that he perform his constitutional duties. Number one, President Biden has violated his oath to faithfully execute immigration laws enacted by Congress. Instead of prosecuting immigrants for the federal crime of illegal entry, President Biden has sent his lawyers into federal courts to sue Texas for taking action to secure the border. So you could say like, oh, he's suing and stuff like that. Well, he wasn't the first one to sue. He's had lawsuits come his way from Biden and his administration Mm -hmm. uh, over them trying to protect the country, something that Biden was sworn to do Mm -hmm. when he entered office. Um, So not only are they failing to do that, but they are suing people who are doing their job for them. That, that, I mean, you can say I'm being biased here, but but I don't see how you'd see this any other way. <laughs> this is, this is, I'm just being honest here. Um, President Biden has instructed his agencies to ignore federal statutes that mandate the detention of illegal immigrants. Uh, the effect is to illegally allow their en masse parole into the United States. By wasting taxpayer dollars to tear open Texas's border security infrastructure, President Biden has enticed illegal immigrants away from the 28 legal entry points along this state's southern border bridges where nobody drowns and into the dangerous waters of the Rio Grande. So what kind of the, the, the tipping point for all of this was there was a mother and a child who drowned in the river just earlier this month. And it's at this point where he's trying to put up the razor wire. And so both sides now are blaming each other for that drowning. And they're saying, well, because you're doing this, that's what caused that. And they're saying, well, your lack of action is what caused this. And so, you know, round and round it goes. Um, here's the part I wanted to get to. I'm not going to, re- I'm not going to read. There's a page of this, but I'm not reading you the whole thing. I'm trying to just give you the best, best points of this. Under President Biden's lawless border policies, more than 6 million Im- illegal immigrants have crossed our southern border in just three years. That is more than the population of 33 different states in this country. Mm. Uh, this illegal refusal to protect the states has inflicted unprecedented harm on the people all across the United States. And here, here's my favorite part. He's invoking these historical figures. James Madison, Alexander Hamilton and the other visionaries who wrote the U.S. Constitution foresaw that states should not be left to the mercy of a lawless president who does nothing to stop external threats like cartels smuggling millions of illegal immigrants across the border. That is why the framers included both Article 4, Section 4, which promises that the federal government shall protect each state against invasion, and Article 1, uh, Section 10, Clause 3, which acknowledges the state's sovereign interest in protecting their borders. The failure of the Biden administration to fulfill these duties imposed by this article has triggered Article 1, which reserves to this state the right of self-defense. For these reasons, I have already declared an invasion under Article 1 to invoke Texas's constitutional authority to defend and protect itself. The authority is the supreme law of the land and supersedes any federal statutes to the contrary. The Texas National Guard, the Texas Department of Public Safety, and other Texas personnel are acting on that authority as well as state law to secure the Texas border. Now, since this was written, 
uh, between then and, and essentially the time that I've been preparing this uh, and, and doing my research, uh, 25 of the 50 states of America have thrown in their support behind mm. Governor Abbott and has said, this is correct. What, what, what Abbott is taking a stand for uh, impacts all the other states. And so these 25 governors have acknowledged that and have thrown their backing for it. They said, if you need more uh, razor wire, <laughs> we'll send it. They said, if you need our National Guard for our states, we will send it and, and help at the border. Um, so you've got this um, you've got this boiling point that's happening here. And really, Biden, in, in my, I'm sure other people have other opinions, but um, in my opinion, he's in an unwin- unwinnable circumstance here because he can either uh, do nothing and, and allow it to continue on or, and this is kind of the more scarier part, uh, he can, because there has been a precedent for this, this happened some some situation in Alabama in, ni- in 1963 involving JFK uh, where he he activated, I'm not going to use the right terminology, so please forgive me, but he somehow activated the National Guard that was for the states and said, you now answer to me, and he federalized it and essentially marched in there. And and uh, essentially what this would be in this situation is federalizing the National Guard that's supposed to be protecting our nation's borders and the state's borders and saying, you work for me, now go and tear all this down and literally watch the stream of people come in after they tear all that stuff down. So, and that would be unprecedented. Uh, nobody's ever done it before. And, and really what we're seeing is already unprecedented. I know I've said that. Um, but I wanted to give kind of the scope for this. Dan, I, I'm curious to ask you because I was thinking, I wonder, um, and I know you don't, there's no pressure on you because you don't represent all libertarians everywhere. Oh, I'm ready for this. Yeah. So what would you say, like, should the federal should the feds be involved in the border crisis at all and, or what degree yeah i think they have a responsibility to support texas mm-hmm. i think texas has the responsibility to protect itself yeah what they say goes first mm-hmm. below that or above that the individual has the responsibility to protect himself mm-hmm. so you defend your home right and Personal the people property. that are around you defend that area. They protect the one against the tyranny of the many. Right. And that could be foreign or domestic. Mm-hmm. So as a libertarian, I would say, without a doubt, this is just me speaking as, as where I stand on it. Yeah. Or where I believe the libertarians stand on it, is right or wrong, the states decide for themselves what to do. Now, if they decide wrong, they make the wrong decision. Let's say that Texas just decides we're going to open it up and let everybody flood in. Right. Then the yeah. the federal federal level comes in and says, "No, we protect the borders of this great nation against enemies foreign and domestic." And that's enemies mm-hmm. foreign and domestic. You can come in through the door. Right, that we've prepared for you. We can come in through the door. Right, where it's not as and this is what it's made out to be on the other side is it's a xenophobic kind of thing of we don't want anybody in here, which is completely f- as far from the truth as it can right. be. It's we want anybody to come in. There's just a process. And if you expedite the process, not only is it unfair to the people who are trying to go through the process and, and frankly struggling because of how overwhelmed the system is mm-hmm. by all this influx of and illegal. not just on our side of the razor wire fence. Right. But on their side of the razor wire fence, it's a complete catastrophe. Yeah, absolutely. A humanitarian crisis. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Not just like, oh, they just don't like it in Mexico. They just want to come here. That's not the case. Yeah. The case is their system is so screwed up that they're leaving it in droves. They're willing to die in a river Mm -hmm. to take the chance of dying in a river to get away from what's going on down there. It's kind of like when you had people sailing over from Cuba in like in cardboard box boats because they, because the situation there was untenable. Yeah. And I get that. And what's funny is uh, you see some people, they're less sympathetic for the people fleeing Cuba than they are with people fleeing Mexico mm-hmm. because 
the people coming from Cuba with it will give you horror stories of what happened in their country, and they they don't want that to get spread because it, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of socialism that happened there in Cuba, and it got off the rails. I mean, yeah, we'll get into that, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, as a libertarian, it's it goes, it goes. The states decide. Mm-hmm. The states are their own thing. The person is his own thing. The states are their own thing, yeah. and last on the list, last on the list is the national. Right, and, and and what people need to understand about this that I think a lot of people aren't aware of is the original agreement for the United States of America, for the the union to happen between all 50 states, they all had to agree to it, and there was terms agreed to when that happened. And one of the first and primary terms was the state still have a right to protect itself and its borders. Mm-hmm. And 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 no state, none of them, all 50 of them would not have agreed to come into the union had they known that they could just be superseded by the, the federal government. Right. Which so, is why we don't make little nation states. Right. Yeah. Right. Because we have that. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. There, there's a, yeah, I really wasn't going to say much more than that, but it, essentially there's a, a union and, and we both entered it uh, in agreement. Like it, it had to be beneficial for the states to join the union and and the agreement was beneficial to the states. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be. Well, I definitely don't have the market cornered on on American history knowledge and I've proved that time and time again. <laughs> I had to learn but, a lot of this in preparation. So, But I, I do understand the principle of the... It's not 51% protects 49%. It's not, you know what I mean? It literally is the many protect the one against the tyranny of the, the government protects the one against the tyranny of the many. Yeah. So that if you are in your area and they say no African Americans are allowed, then they don't have a right to kick that one African American out. We don't seem to have a problem understanding that concept, Mm -hmm. right? We protect that one person against the 99. Right. It's funny you you brought up that illustration because, you know, I said it's not entirely unprecedented for uh, the the feds to come in and, and stop, overrule a state on a matter. But that's exactly what happened in 1963. Uh, I don't have all the details, but I have a general knowledge of it. And it was... um, the governor was pushing back on the segregation at an Alabama university. Mm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, things that we would all agree with today should not be segregated. Well, (laughs) we're kind of going back in the other direction of that again, the opposite of what was happening at that time. Um, But I digress in that. Uh, Essentially we agree like, you know, everybody should be treated fairly and equally in in the justice system. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, we all have a king. Okay, we all have a king, and his name is Jesus. Right. Okay, and until he returns and rights all the wrongs in the world, we have to learn to coexist. We have to learn to be here with unbelievers, and we have to govern ourselves with unbelievers. Right. Fight against the prejudices. Yeah, and, and we have to do all those things. We have to love live, our neighbor. We have to live in this world temporarily ruled by the prince of the power of the air. We have to figure out how to make this whole thing work. And in my opinion... Rather than making one fallen sinful man a king right. and everybody being under them, yep. the best way to do it is to come up with everybody agrees. Yeah. And we can't come to everybody agrees because if everybody wanted all the same things, then that wouldn't work either. Yeah. Okay. So we have to say we have to pick representatives. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. This I'm going to pick you. You're going to represent me and everybody in my town in this discussion because we can't have everybody's opinion. Right. Right. Yep. But have that one agreement. person, you have to protect me, my opinion. And we can't say that my opinion is more valuable than the next person's. Yep. So we come up with this system where we have one representative for an area and yep. then we have a representative for that area. They have which, a responsible, by the way, responsibility to speak for the people. Which, by the way, Moses' father in law came up with. If you notice, it's like it is a representative republic that he yeah. kind of <clears> says, <throat> Moses, man, you cannot. I'm, it's Moses, right? It's not. You mean, I get Moses and Abraham. You mean uh, his father-in-law in Midian? I think so. Okay. I'm because that would be Moses. That'd if, be Moses. Okay. He said, "You can't. You don't need to make every decision. 
Yeah. You need to pick 10 dudes. Oh, you're right. Yep. I remember what you're talking about. And let those 10 guys make those decisions and they pick their people and they pick their people. Yep. Representatives in a republic. Which is what happened with the tribes and that's what happened with uh, Joshua sending the people to spy out the land. Because. Is that system. Because ultimately our king in this monarchy is Jesus. Right. Exactly. And and this is why our forefathers, I'll, I'll specific, I know it was a group of people, but specifically George Washington, despite everyone, and not, maybe I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people were pushing for him to become the king after the Revolutionary War. And he they said, said, he said, I don't want to have anything to do with that. He said, we, uh, essentially, if you've ever seen the game, uh, or not the game, if you've ever seen the movie Hunger Games, uh, you had this long struggle to do away with this regime that was in charge and, and forcing these people to be pitted up against each other to fight to the death. They finally overthrew that regime. And then w- what do you have? You have the, the leader of the rebellion that had taken place. Spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah. The spoiler alert if you haven't seen it. <laughs> they come into power and they're like, okay, since they did that to us, we're going to do this same thing back to them. We're going to make our own Hunger Games and they're going to have to fight into it. And immediately that drew up red flags like, well, we're just going to repeat the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like essentially that was, it's a retelling of America. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, okay, we just uh, overthrew the tyranny of England and we're not going to have another king and have the same tyranny. So they had the forethought at least to put in uh, checks and balances in a place. That's what the the Supreme Court and, and, uh, you know, the legislative branch and the judicial branch, all that stuff was put into place to check each other. Nothing was supposed to get too big for their britches and 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 overthrow, you know, be a, a king. But to your point, what you're saying, Dan, uh, oftentimes that's what it seems like is happening is people are being viewed as king and they have supreme authority. Yes. They're not being checked. And yes, that is true. And that improper understanding, the other the opposition, they capitalize on that. Yes. Yep. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? One of my biggest pet peeves, and this goes out to all you pastors out there, <laughs> one of my biggest pet peeves is when we pray for our government and we use the word leaders. Mm, mm-hmm. They are not public our servants, leaders, right? They, ser- we are the leaders. Uh-huh. We are the dog. They are the tail. Mm-hmm. Should be the tail does That's not wag the dog. Be. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. We we pray for our representatives. Yeah, but we—they are not leaders. We are the leaders. Mm-hmm. When the Bible says that our leaders, we are to be submissive to our leaders. Mm. That is a message for representatives, or that is a message yeah. for people in a monarchy under we, a the king people. that are to respect the leaders yeah. in that way. We are Good the point. leaders that ought to be respected, mm-hmm. and that's not to say that we wield our power in an unChristian way. Yeah. Or anything like, or whatever we say goes. It's yeah. not like that at all. My point is, it's not we when the politician walks by and we bow and we, you know what I mean. We genuflect when you know congressman whoever walks by. You know what mm-hmm. I mean. That is not the message of that of the Bible. Okay, right. that is not how that works. So that's kind of this idea, like you're saying that we have now which is like they're the leaders and they're to be you know it's like yeah it's crazy talk we have a responsibility what we want as as american citizens as average american believer non-believer we kind of want like a set it and forget it yeah we don't want to be involved we want to just pick this guy and say this guy this this republican dude or this even libertarians right we Mm want to just pick libertarians and then once we do They'll go out and do libertarian stuff, and then we won't have to ever worry about it because mm-hmm. of this, that, and the other thing. But that's not how it works. It's an yeah. active relationship. We have to be involved. We have to get knowledgeable. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not knowledgeable. Your responsibility about as this American to, is not limited to just going out on election day. It is a constant. Uh, it should be a constant communication with our public servants and, and voicing what we the people want. I'm, a, I'm a small government libertarian. I look at it like in an ideal situation, we would give them as few responsibilities as humanly possible, and we would hold their feet to the fire on those responsibilities. Yeah. And sadly, that doesn't happen. And today. that doesn't happen because we can't get buy in from everybody. Uh, to be fair, though, Abbott is trying to hold them t- their feet to the fire in this situation. Uh, I know other people are going to disagree with my opinion on these things, but uh, you can at least say that he's trying to check it. He's mm-hmm. trying to. Uh, 
he's trying to appeal to what our country was founded on. Yeah. Which I think is good. Um, well, I mean, there, it could go other places from here, but we'll see. I, uh, to add a little bit more context here, uh, there was a record-breaking month last month uh, from what I have here. The information I found online was there was 300,000 encounters of illegal immigrants. Never before had there been that many. And, and I want to point out, that was what had been encountered. That's just what we know of. That's why to put a real number on illegal immigration, you can't fully wrap your mind around it because it's illegal. It's off the books. There's no way to track it. But what they've encountered is 300,000. We can assume multiple, a, a multiple number of 300,000 is what actually crossed the border in last year alone. So that's probably o- upwards of a million. So, um, and I, I want to point this out. Why, why do we, why are we as Christians concerned about this crisis? Um, there, are, this is a fact, and this is backed up by data, real world data you can look up. There are more slaves on this earth than there ever was in human history, at mm-hmm. least what we have recorded. Uh, and slavery, meaning a, a majority of this, is sex trafficking, sex slavery. So what's happening is um, there's all kind, there's fentanyl, un, unprecedented numbers being smuggled in through the country, and terrorists coming through. People can say, "Well, there's all these uh, dreamers, and there's people coming through here, and they want a better life, and all that kind of stuff." I know all those arguments about that kind of stuff. Yeah, but, that's some Orwell stuff right there. Yeah, yeah. They're, we refer to them as dreamers. Yeah, yeah. Because it makes you say well you don't want to stop dreamers it's an appeal to people's compassion it's trying to make it an emotional issue which is another point that some people have made with the supreme court ruling is that maybe the people who voted the five that did vote in favor of taking down the barbed wire Mm -hmm. it became an emotional issue for them Mm -hmm. which is scary to me because our supreme court should not be based off of emotion Mm -hmm. it should be based off of the law the law yeah that i don't know which is scarier if that's true or if it's not so there Essentially, you have what is a Trojan horse. You have millions of people coming in, even just a handful of terrorists. Like, they've documented that some of the illegal immigrants coming over have flown into Mexico from countries all around the world that are because they know there's a weak point in our Mm -hmm. nation, and that's how they're getting in. And, and, and that's like, you can't argue with that. That, that's just a fact, and that's happening. And where you will, where, you and I, if I'm speaking to somebody who disagrees with this whole matter, where we would disagree is uh, you would probably say, well, it's worth it to bring all these other people in here. Um, I know a lot of people argue the refugee status of people and saying like, well, it's refugees coming in. And uh, man, I had some notes here somewhere on that. But essentially, refugee status has to do with uh, you can... You can define them as being oppressed by regime from a bodily harm standpoint or death. Like they are fleeing that, they are seeking asylum, and and it's over uh, race, creed, or religion. And th- we're, now we're talking about international law, right? The refugee status is an international law that says that if somebody's fleeing for their life, uh, seeking asylum, that the neighboring country has to has to protect them. But I'm curious to. And I, I'm not. I don't expect you to have the answer to this, but when that happens, is it like they can come in any way they see fit, or do they always have to go through the front door? Like, if let's say that we were doing this is the the border crisis isn't a, a thing, and there really is a humanitarian crisis that forces people out of Mexico. Do we say yes? We do that, but. Go through this front door. Yeah, that's that's what it's supposed to be. Now, okay. what you have happening in Mexico is it's overwhelmed and overrun, and those people would probably get the, it. It's cyclical. This is a cyclical issue because if you don't, if Governor Abbott doesn't do what he's doing, declaring a state of emergency like an invasion, and invoke all these things in the um, in the. Um, in the uh, articles of the of the laws and all that kind of stuff, if he's not doing that, and we don't get a, a handle on the influx of people, then even the people coming in the front door can't be processed because it's all seized up and bound up, and it's just far from being it's it's being overwhelmed. And um, that's why when I'm talking about this issue, 
I don't think, oh, we just need to build a wall or put up some razor <laughs> wire. Like the whole thing needs to be fixed. The mm-hmm. whole system needs to be fixed, but you can't begin to fix it until you, it's like, um, if you've ever been a part of a company and, uh, I won't go into a personal scenario here, but if you've ever been a part of a company who you go through maybe a hiring freeze and you can't hire and you just feel like there's times where you're overwhelmed, you don't have the staff or the manpower. Now picture that, but like on steroids, like a hundred times, yeah. that's what's happening at the border. They just don't have the manpower or the resources or even the money to be able to process the amount of people coming through. And it's being overwhelmed. If If you stop that influx... Of people come because there's so much effort that has to go into chasing people down who have crossed in illegally, and some of them never get found. And, and it is gone on record. You can look it up. Uh, I got this stat from five years ago that every year it costs taxpayers 116 billion dollars uh, in in things. That, what has been caused by illegal immigrants? Mm. And there's some people that argue. Well, a lot of it's. Uh, overdue visas or something, you know, expiring visas and all that kind of stuff. That's actually, as of five years ago, when I look at the da- the data, that's the most recent I could find. Five years ago, that it was stated that 42% of illegal immigrants are the expired visa scenario. That means more than half of them are just coming in illegally. Right. And so that that's what's into those numbers. So I've given a lot of facts and I've given a lot of numbers of this kind of stuff, but essentially what we have... and. The other side arguing against this say it's a moral issue. We can't stop these people from coming in, um, even though it's a part of our law, right? <laughs> it just blows my mind to try to talk of that. But I, I'm trying to talk about it in a sense that doesn't come from overwhelmingness. And I'm trying, I want to try to consider some of the arguments that the other side would have. And maybe it's you as a Christian, you're listening, and maybe you have family members who are dealing with it more personally. Um, I want to be sensitive to that. So, when we're talking about this issue, understand that both sides are trying to argue a moral high ground, but it is a moral issue. And that's why I said from the beginning, even though there's political elements here, there's a morality to it. Um, and we know when we're talking about morality, where's morality come from? It should come. If you're a believer, you understand that morality comes from God. The only morality that we have in this nation or as a, a people it, it comes from the Bible. It comes from his word. The only one that has a found has legs to stand on. Right, yeah. You can make it up as you go, Yeah. but then what is the next person next to you? <clears throat> what prevents them? Who decides when you both disagree? Yeah, if, if there's no, uh, what would you call it? Like if there's no basis for it. Yeah. If there's if there's no if it's not anchored in if it's anything, all relative. It, yeah, it, it's going to change from age to age, from day mm-hmm. to day, even mm-hmm. from people to people, and it and has that, to be in something that's absolute. And that sounds like an argument from a slippery slope. It look it sounds like I'm saying, well, if it, if we don't have this, then it'll all devolve into madness. You know, but the but fact it will. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is. If we all decide for ourselves what's right and wrong, mm-hmm. then nobody decides what's right and wrong. Yeah, yeah. We're, Every opinion is equally valid, including racism, including yep. all the bad things you don't want to see. All the bad things. It all gives yeah, way to that. All the things on the internet. The, the points you can't have the points you're for, and it also not work out for the people that have points that you're totally against. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's just unhinged. And uh, and that's what it boils down to is there there are some people that believe that those people trying to come over illegally because they're in search of a better life or whatever, they would say they have a right to come in by whatever means necessary. That's what the argument is that's happening. But uh, essentially, <clears throat> if you're not protecting a border, you don't have a border. If you're not preventing people from coming in and it's just a free for all. Mm-hmm. There is no border. And you can make a very like to me this is just a logical sound case. If your nation does not have borders, is it even a nation at all? Right. Precisely. I've seen somebody come to a table and try to argue this matter and they come and they cuz you know they're trying to debate about it, but this person comes in and says all this stuff about a nation and borders and then they say, "Well, wait a minute." Do you actually believe that nations are a thing? And they and they would come when they really nail them to it. They say, "Well, 
nations are kind of there. There's no contract for nations, so I don't really believe in nations. Okay, well, if you don't even come to the table at that, there's no way to find common ground on this issue because you don't even believe nations are a thing. So we we can't talk about a nation's borders because you don't believe in nations. But that's where I think a lot of people are unknowingly they they don't believe there should be borders, but they believe a nation can exist without borders. Maybe it can for a time, but it won't exist long. Definitely not. And, and that's this is not a a Judeo Christian idea. This is not a um, uh, a twenty first century thing. It's not a Western idea. This has been something that has been happening for since time beginning. Um, any nation that's stuck around has had borders and has enforced those borders. So, well, I think it's a good borders are. And I'm just riffing here. Mm-hmm. Borders are a condition of the fall. Yeah, yeah. Because mm-hmm. border didn't come about until so after the fall. We can't trust people. Because as soon as the fall happened, God said, "Okay, I'm going to put, a, I'm going to put a border, and there's an angel to protect it." Yeah, that was the first border after, that happened. Was after the fall, they could no the longer fall. enter into the. Because again, I go back to we have one king, right? But we are in a sin fallen world, right? So mm-hmm. temporarily, we have to make this system work for everybody. And the best way to do that is not imagine there's no country. Mm-hmm. It's imagine countries with strong borders. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, this The fact of the matter is, is this is this is the world we live in. I'm just going to look up a book while you're talking. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, but essentially, this, this, is the, this is what we're at. Like, it would be great if we had a utopia. But we just simply can't have that this side of Earth, and I think that's where you're going to have a lot of uh, differing opinions on this. Is some people believe that well, let, let's always see the best in others, um, but the reality of it is there are evil people coming into our country in droves, really, and that is essentially I think what the governor is getting at when he says there's an invasion happening. So this book was written I don't know when a while back. But it's written by this guy called Evan Sayet. You ever heard of this book? It's called The Kindergarten of Eden, How Modern Liberals Think, oh, and Why uh-oh. He's Convinced That Ignorance is Bliss. It's a short read, uh, but it's so potent. Hmm. It's so great. I don't even know that the guy's a Christian, but it's definitely a great book, and it will give you some really cool stuff. And he's the one that, he's where I originally heard that, like, he broke down the, the song Imagine, right, where he's like, not imagine no countries, not imagine strong countries, it's imagine there's no country, mm-hmm. it isn't hard to do, you know, nothing to kill or die for, you know, it's like, the nothing is valuable, there's nothing to kill or die for, there's nothing to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and no religion too. Yeah. You know, and it's like there's there's so much there and I know that's one goofball artist from a time forgotten. Yeah. But but it, it's the it, point it's of true. this attitude like where you where we're saying like <clears throat> is that really is that really good? Yeah. Is it good to imagine there's no heaven? Yeah. It really does come from it, it's uh and some Christians have this worldview of not understanding what it's rooted in. But if you have a worldview that if you're paying attention to it, if it's rooted in no, we can you know, we can bring the best of man and man is the answer and we just need to let these people in here and help them out and or go in and reform those other governments. I've heard people argue that too. And then that will fix it. And like, we don't need walls and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I've heard all this argument. Uh, but what it comes down to is you have to understand in a biblical worldview, yes, we are fallen. We can't force people to do certain things, but we can still protect our borders. We can protect our neighbor. Mm-hmm. Um, that loving, the Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself. If I am against border protection, that is not loving to my neighbor. And people would say, well, you're not loving to your neighbor in the other neighboring countries. On the other side of the border. Right. It's like, well, actually, the most loving thing I can do is to provide a good process for them to come in legally and then them be an actual American citizen and and have a sense of belonging and purpose and all those. Like, that's the best thing we can do for these people. Mm -hmm. And... uh, I think this is the crux of the issue. I know all the arguments against border protection, 
But I think if we don't do that, then we can't allow for those good scenarios I just laid out where we take somebody who is looking for a better life and can let them go through the legal process and do it the right way. I think that can't happen and will continue to be held up and prevent people from... And people are saying, well, they it's so slow and it's such a bad system. That's why we got to let them in illegally. Well, the fact that we're letting them in illegally is what's causing that problem. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's like I was saying earlier, it's cyclical. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. Uh, the other point I want to make about this that's coming to me now is while that system is being repaired, mm-hmm. okay, while we're sort of saying, we're saying that system needs to be fixed... We in Michigan, as people who have 40-hour week jobs and families, we might not be able to affect that situation directly, uh, save like getting on a podcast and talking about it. Mm -hmm. If you are in a church that is near there, right, or you have you know people who are affected by this situation, you can be humanitarian, you can have a humanitarian bent you mm-hmm. can do something to help those people at the yep. same time as we can do we both wait yeah as we, while we're waiting to fix that system and yes it's not great that it's it's terrible that it's happening but in the midst of it mm-hmm. we can be loving patient yep. kind good faithful gentle and you know we can do all those things we can be a a catalyst for good in a world of darkness Mm -hmm. in this situation and many others we can be the change we want to see Mm -hmm. in those situations yes as easily as and in fact a hundred times easier than we can trying to change the system yeah yeah, you know what i mean not to say we should ignore the change of the system or anything like that i'm definitely not saying that you should definitely be involved careful who you vote for yep you know what i mean Mm -hmm. if you if you find if you voting is important that kind of thing but um but in the meantime we can look in our world or we can sort of like you were talking earlier about seeing what it is that we can do in our own sphere and Mm -hmm. and not you know and being led by the spirit and not you know, like the Bible says, if you walk by the Spirit, you won't be gratifying the desires of the flesh, right? Right. You'll walk by the Spirit and deal with what's in front of you and be a humanitarian in that way at the same time while this other thing is going on. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, there's so many arguments, and I've I've listened to some debates of people on both sides of talking about the issue. And what's funny is depending on what year you go back to, like even as recent as 10, 10 years ago or less, depending on who's in power and who's having to deal with the issue, typically it's been both sides that have said like, no, this system is messed up and we need to reform it. Uh, so both sides really agree. It's kind of funny that we're at this uh, stalemate right now in the, as a country on the border because uh, at times we've gone back and forth. Both parties have said like, no, this needs to be fixed and it needs to be fixed. But what a lot of people have a hard time with is they so closely associate any kind of wall or border, a physical barrier being put up as being a bad thing, an inhumane thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Well, uh, they think that they're like poor farmers and, yeah. and fatherless children. And while that may be some single of Single mothers and poor farmers coming through. It's and it's by, like it's far from all of them. And for those folks, you know what I mean. It's like we, I mean, let's do it. Can to help them. Yeah, but yep. but does this help them to come into a country shoulder to shoulder with someone who wishes to do harm? I watched a video where this lady came in to talk about this issue, and she herself had just in the recent years became an American citizen uh, legally, and so she went through the whole process. But now where she lives. It was a part, I think, in Austin, near Austin. And she said in the apartment where she lives, she said she daily fears for her life. And she is uh, right next to some other uh, people in the apartment that are causing crime. She's getting stolen from. Her apartment's being broken into, all these things. And she knows they're there illegally. Mm -hmm. Like some of these people, like 
she she knows like distantly like through several different degrees of separation but she knows like they're here illegally and she she came in and they had to blur this lady's face out because she was just scared for her life she said i don't want to talk about this but at the same time i have to because i'm scared for my family and i so you have the peop the same people that one side would say well think about these people and, and they need help Okay, but there are those same people that have made it, that have come across, gone through all the steps. They're here now legally, and, and, and they, they are getting a better life, and they ran away from some really bad things back home. But now they're almost, they're close to being in the same position. In a place like Austin, which is a little far away from the border, it's the capital of Texas, but there's places even in Austin where somebody can live who used to live in Mexico who is starting to reconsider even living here because they, they thought, I'm going to get a better life over here, but now they're dealing with the same people they ran away from because they're coming in illegally. Mm -hmm. And that, what I just talked about, I think doesn't get talked about enough. And, and I'm, I'm not making that up. That's a real scenario I watched in a video, a real lady who was talking about this scenario, and I think it's representative of what's going on in all the different surrounding uh, the areas close by the border in all four states. So I think a lot about what can we do about it. Like if if we know about these situations, like we've talked to you and I in the past about um, not getting too sucked into the news because it can right. really wreck your day. It can really make you be faithless in moments, you know, because you can say like it's a problem that's too big for me to handle. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I go, I go, okay, what can we do as, uh, as I said, like work a day, average guys, families, 40 hour week jobs, that kind of thing. What can we do to make that make that change and i we talked in the past too about uh being prepared and being physically prepared for something to happen and being um financially prepared to take care of your family to be spiritually prepared and i feel that what i do mainly to contribute to this problem is i try to uh like with this podcast we are we are trying to spread this whole thing from our perspective mm -hmm. to the people so that they can latch on to the things promote of the awareness Lord, promote to, so that they can latch on to the things of the Lord, make their lives better, be more prepared, be morally know what's morally right, you know, in these times and sort of that's how I affect this. Now some people they knock on doors and have petitions signed and they become mm -hmm. political, mm -hmm. and they chase the office and stuff like that. And then or more, humanitarian efforts. Or humanitarian, right. They go to the Red Cross or Samaritan's Purse or whatever, the thing that they do, and that's great. Mm -hmm. So by, by, by the point I'm making is we ought to think about what we can do in our sphere, in our, in our um, circle – Yes. To make to make things better, yep. because it's one thing to point at the issue and yep. say this is bad. And somebody needs to change that. Mm -hmm. But unless you are gonna get going to be the electee, mm -hmm. unless you are going to pack up your family and go down to Texas and become a border patrol agent or become a Texas official or whatever. What, what is even the organization for Texas? Is it just like Texas government, like police or? Um, who's who's putting up the razor wire? If you're going to go down there and put up the razor wire yourself, yeah, I think, then you're doing something. You know what I mean? I want to say that he's invoked, at least at this point, I don't know if it... Sometimes it's Border Patrol agents, but other times it's... I, I think what's happening right now is uh, the National Guard for Texas has been activated to go out there and, and do what the governor wants them to do. So you, unless you're going to be a National Guardsman mm -hmm. or woman... And even then, your orders could change tomorrow if you get federalized. So, like, yeah, that you're you're not really doing much in that situation. That's a whole other thing there. Like, what if you get ordered to do something you don't believe exactly. that you should do? Yep. That's a whole other thing. So you could say, like, well, I'm not that. But really, you might be in a better position as a civilian, like what you're getting at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I like to think a lot about what we can do, what we can do to solve that problem. We can be the change we want to see mm -hmm. we can do like we can start in uh jerusalem then judea then samaria and then yes. the ends of the earth right we can sort of use that model of like first of all take care of what's going on in my in my sphere yep. then help my family then help my friends then acquaintances then 
strangers, right? We can move yeah. in out. And so that's sort of how I think of it. And I look at it like I prepare, I prepare people spiritually to contend with this world. I do it in my personal life, mm-hmm. in my leadership role at church and in this podcast and in my work life and things like that. I try to look at it like that's what I'm doing to contribute to the solution to this problem. Cause it yeah. is a sin problem. Ultimately yep. it's a yep. sin problem. The sin problem is that Ever, that people, you dig down deep enough, it's the same root as all the other ones. Right, exactly. Yep. So to contend with that, I'm bringing, I'm helping to, I'm trying to what how I how I sleep at night because this stuff really does weigh on me. I think about it a lot more than I do anything about it. But I, but you know, the idea sure. of, of yeah, by the no evil means evil in the world, the 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 needle moving on the evil of the world toward the evil evil of the world kind of thing, the scales balancing, tipping mm-hmm. in their direction, it does weigh on me. Yeah, you know, so it's like, how do you how do you f- sleep at night with all that, and how yeah. do you balance all that awful, uncontrol? You know, as evil as it can be, that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. Yeah. You know, how do you ban- how do you sleep at night knowing you haven't have you done enough? Mm-hmm. You know, have you done enough to to make things better? You're not gonna you Josh are not gonna. I'm just saying, you might, I don't know, whatever the Lord <laughs> wants you to do, but you are not going to pack up your family and move down there and start yeah. hauling out the razor wire. you got to figure out what you can do yeah. from here. It's funny, I just had a conversation with somebody two months ago, like, if war broke out in Texas tomorrow, I'd be kissing my family and telling them, <laughs> I love you, I'm going to go fight Wow. For- for the country, essentially the state, but yeah, the, the states make up the country. Well, but, that's it. But you know, that was more of a. I w- I don't know if I was exactly serious about that, but the sentiment behind it was is that I I still would fight for you know what I believe in mm-hmm. and uh, for the protection of people because here's the thing. Today we're talking about Texas. Tomorrow it could be much bigger than that, mm-hmm. and um, you don't want to wait until everything's on your doorstep. You want to see the first inclination of danger and act. Now, I'm not saying act in such a way of like going and fighting. I'm, what I'm saying well, is more along the lines of, I think what you're getting at and doing things about it as a civilian to help change the direction that we are headed as a country. Mm-hmm. And, and that the primary, the responsibility falls on the church, the church, especially in America uh, the, you've never been in a better position than you are right now to step up and to do something about the world that you see around you. Right. Um, it, it's little things, but like, for example, if everybody went around and just started being a light to people like Jesus was with his disciples, that would start change. It. The Bible says that they turned the world upside down. Uh, and and obviously that was speaking to the known world at that time, but they really did, and it started with twelve people. I, I want to bet, and uh, this is coming from somebody who's in a very tiny church right now, uh, just recently made that change. Um, I'm in a tiny church, but I still have. M- there's more than twelve people there. Not much, but there's more than twelve people mm. there on a on a regular basis. And guess what? If the disciples can do what they did. In their day and age, mm-hmm. we can too. You can. The, the same God that they serve is the same God that we serve right now. It's just about, and, and that's why, like, if everything I said today just makes it so you can't sleep at night, that was not the chief end of this uh, for any of you listeners. It is not to promote worry and fear. It is a call to action. And I'm not saying grab your guns and let's go. And, like, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the call to action here is, um, we need to live the life that God intended us to live and Amen. live it to the fullest. Oh my goodness. Like th- there's no more time for this um, uh, lackadaisical life. We can't be complacent anymore. What I'm, what I'm telling you, Christian, today, you cannot afford to live a complacent Christian life anymore. You never really could, mm-hmm. if we're being honest with it. But, but now is the time to, to wake up. Uh, as as even Paul has put it in the Bible, um, there in the Book of Esther we find that familiar verse that says, "For such a time as this." If you are listening to this today, what we just said in this podcast, you were put at this point in time for a reason. 
Um, that's not to stress you out. It, it really should be exciting to you because God has a plan and you get to be a part of it. But let me tell you, if you're going to continue living your life complacent and saying, uh, I'm fine just doing this, I just want to stay in my little hole and, and not, not worry. Listen, your brother and sister around you are clamoring in the darkness and yeah. we need to uh, reach out to our brothers and sisters, reach out to the lost and help those people any way that we can. And the best way to do that is through your church. Right, we, absolutely. We need to get the church moving. You, If you were to go out into the street and there was 100 people standing around talking about what was going on, and you're the only Christian and you stand up and you say, I think the solution to this is that you all come to faith in the Lord, mm-hmm. then they would say, if they're not being judgmental, they would say, cool, what then? Yeah. And... And so, I, I'll tell you, I backed away from the mic because I felt I was getting excited. I was thought I was going to be like, ah! <laughs> so, if you were in the public square and you had a hundred people around and you said, "Come to know the Lord," that that'll solve this problem. Mm-hmm. They might say, "Okay, great. What then? Like, why? What does that do?" Because you know, you because that's complacent Christian life is. You come to know the Lord, and then it doesn't really impact anything. Mm-hmm. You just kind of like, yeah, oh, the church is something I do. Yeah. We go, we sit, we listen, we high five, we go home. Yeah. But when we, mm-hmm. but now we talk, you and I talk this podcast for the purpose of equipping those Christians yes. to contend in this crazy, mixed up, upside down world yep. ruled temporarily by the prince of the power of the air. Yep. And we are here to say that this is the solution to the problem right and it has like 1189 chapters yep ready to tell you exactly what to do exactly how it applies to this situation and that situation and this situation and that situation from the great big huge crises to the little neighbor to neighbor over the fence issue right uh, this this podcast, this episode, is not a call to war, even though you'll hear from different sides that people are saying, I think this is leading to a civil war, and, and uh, who knows the future. But what this is a call to in this podcast is that this is a call to live a life in faith Ooh. every day. Every day we are to live a life in faith, because that is what is going to make lasting change, lasting difference in this country. If we are all, if every Christian was living a life of faith every day, the the, the world would, would be turned upside down. Just that one thing. Just that one thing. That one Operating change. in the biblical sense that God calls us to live in, and, and, and being full of faith, being bold, going out full of faith, and, and not, being, not being shrinking back and being timid. Winning the loss. Full of compassion. Full of boldness, uh, full of confidence. Boldness, I love that word. Yes, uh, it, there's boldness and humility. If you pair those two together with the God's word and with the Holy Spirit and dwelling in you and guiding you, uh, there's there's no limit to what God can do through that person grabbing hold of those things. And so, this is not a call to war because we don't know what the future holds. This is a call to the war that you are already in. That is a spiritual warfare. Amen to that. We're fighting that every day. And what I want to point out that's so crucial to this discussion is what is happening at the border is the bleeding over of a deep spiritual warfare that's been ongoing for years in this country. Mm. And it is pouring out into the physical, into the tangible the spiritual warfare is so much. Uh, if you do some research in the Bible, you'll see that there was a specific archangel designated to the nation of Israel, and that was um, Michael. And uh, and and these are great warriors, warrior angels that are archangels. And there are some that believe that there is an archangel uh, for every nation. And if that is, I, let me tell you. That archangel is in the fight of his life in in America, and probably the fight of his life, you know, in other countries as well. But because the whole world is groaning, like the Bible said, would happen in the in the last days. But in spiritual warfare, you know, we we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We see the flesh and blood every day, but understand it's so much deeper than that. So, if anything, allow this border crisis to be the alarm bells to let you know, hey. Uh, if you liken it to like a carbon monoxide alarm, what is that alarm going off for? It's saying there is poisonous gas filling up your house and it's gotten to the point where you need to get out. 
And so don't get me wrong. I'm not saying get out of America. What I'm saying is, is do something about it. Mm -hmm. It is high time, as the Bible puts it, to wake up. And if we see time and time again throughout the Bible, we have an admonition as believers in Christ to watch and pray. But understand, even though that word watch, it doesn't mean necessarily like watching. It's not a spectator watching. It is a vigilant watch. And it is when I see trouble, I will act upon the trouble. And then I will warn people of the trouble coming. One of the greatest things you can do in this day and age is to say, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Mm. The time to be saved is now because as we see the world crashing down, understand that this world's not going to last forever. We, those of us that know the, the way the world is going to go mm-hmm. and the way the Bible says it's going to go, it's not going to last forever. And this may not be it. I know time and time again, people think this is it. This is when everything comes crashing down and, and it all comes back at some ebbs point. Ebbs and flows. It ebbs and flows. But at some point, there will be that time. Somebody's going to call it every single time. But there will be a time on God's timeline where he says, that's it. That's the cutoff point. Um, but just understand, if you feel it drawing close, it is, it's because it is. We don't know how many more days we have left. But what we do know is that now is the time for salvation. If you're listening to me and you're not saved, now is the time for salvation. If you are saved, talk to your neighbors, do what you can with those people. And, and we just need to get the gospel out. There needs to be a renewed gospel effort in the church. And it's not just about proclaiming truth, but it's about helping your fellow neighbor. Humanitarian efforts, yes. Uh, but the chief end should be the gospel and the discipleship of people. A, a pastor that I love, he said, a preacher that I love, he said, uh, we look around and we see the whole thing falling apart, and all the while it's falling into place. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow, it's, what powerful words. It's really falling into place. If you look around the world, like, yeah, there's all this bad, but it, it's all like a Rubik's Cube, kind of like it's all going to come together at mm-hmm. some point. Um, it, Rubik's Cube, it looks crazy in the middle of it, right? But eventually it all comes out. Yeah. Uh, y- you have to realize that it did not come to be this way overnight, mm-hmm. and it will not, like a television show, resolve in 30 minutes. Right. It's going to be, it is a, it is flowing back this way, mm-hmm. and it's going to take starting now. A journey of a thousand steps starting, a yes. journey of a thousand miles starting with one step. Yes. Going to have to start right now. We're talking like the church needs to see their role mm-hmm. and realize the power that is available to them in the gospel. Yep. You're not just there for potlucks. It is not a powerless gospel. It is a powerful gospel. Yes. And this gets church me on the move. pumped. Yes. I get excited about and, powerful messages out of this ancient word. And, and let me say this, too, because this goes right along with what Dan is saying. This is a multi-generational uh, movement that needs to happen. It's not enough, because we see this time and time again in Israel. Israel ebbed and flowed, but what happened? There was a generation that came after that forgot what God did and forgot, did not know Moses, did not know Joshua, mm-hmm. did not know insert this judge or whatever judge. Had no God and did whatever he thought was right in, in his, his own, own eyes. eyes. Uh, if you're oh. if you're looking on the mall map right now, here's where you are right now. <laughs> you This is where you are on the mall map. You are here. You are here in the, they did which was right in their own eyes. And I mean, that's what it comes down to, like this border issue. It's not what's right in my eyes or what's right in your eyes because that's when we get in debates. It's it's over who says what. No, it's it's about doing what is right in God's eyes. Yeah, I I was when I first became a Christian, I was really interested to know why I believe what I believe and to be able to articulate that. And a lot of that always led me back to apologetics, and apologetics will always lead you back to uh, to fundamental foundational beliefs about stuff. You yeah. know, it's sort of like knocking down walls to um, to opposition to the gospel. Yeah. Right? What's the and fixed point here? What's the fixed point here? Yeah. And I loved, one thing I really always wrapped my head around very easily was this principle of relative morality. Mm. Right? If you say that what you think in your heart is what is right, and I say what I think is right in my own heart, and we disagree, then guess what? Might makes right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's, that's what that leads to. That's a dangerous game to play. That's a da- yeah, right. And that's a sli- And then, well, again, back to this concept of the argument from a slippery slope, but it's like the fact is you don't 
have a moral leg to stand on yep. if everyone gets to decide what is right in their own eyes. And by the way, me allowing you to even have that opinion is if I decide that it's right for me to say that no one gets to have an opinion, uh -huh. then I can enforce that because it's what's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Because I have the power and relative. you don't, and you don't get to express your idea because in my, my truth, mm -hmm. I'm living my truth mm -hmm. in that you don't get to say. Yep. Because you The truth are a that jerk. ends up prevailing is the person with the largest stick. Right. And that's where it ends because that's the fact of the matter is if we don't have we don't have an ultimate authority to appeal to on matters of right and wrong. Right. Then yep. we all are deciding for ourselves if, if in in those war, in that time the people had no god and they and holding holding spiritual hands with the concept of not having a god is the idea of everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. Yes. It's yeah. not just like, mm -hmm. we have this option, we have that option. You you are putting yourself in the place of God. Oh. That, which is a da Whoa. The, the most dangerous place <laughs> I can think of if you say, my morals are, are what is superior. Right. Because you're saying, even if you don't, you say, I don't believe in God. Well, even if you don't believe in him, but the, he exists, and you say my moral morals is the absolute superior morals, you're saying that to even a god. And maybe you don't believe in him, but mm -hmm. he can exist even if you don't believe in him. You're like, I see into this realm and the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. And, and I I've decide. seen that, and I've seen there is no god. I'm yeah. that powerful. Yeah, I'm that powerful. Yeah. Whether you actively say it aloud or not. Yeah. you know, Or you say, I'm totally comfortable with other people deciding for me. Yeah. Mm. which is just as like cuz and that's a that Evan Sayet book he says there are like leaders who actively say things about who actively perpetuate these ideas and then there are foot soldiers who just go along with it yeah without mm -hmm. thinking about it yeah. you know and that's sort of that's another topic but yeah yeah i again i i want to state one more time it is a multi-generational effort um it is not enough for me to wake you up uh, person or you know church member, uh, Christian believer, it is not enough for just you to wake up. You have to wake up to such a degree that you say, "I've seen how this happens and how it can happen over so many decades." And not only am I going to be the change, but I'm going to make sure that my children are informed and that they understand the reason why we double down on these things over here. And why we made this big push, this big revival, this big gospel-centered effort. Um, and, and your children have to bear the torch. It has to be multi-generational because, um, I mean, great, praise God if things do turn around. But if we're back here in a couple more centuries, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was all for naught. And he, the lasting way is that it can't just be a God of my parents' generation uh, I've talked about this on this podcast before. I believe even our intro talks about this. The Your relationship with God has to be personal for you. It can't just be, well, my, I grew up this, my parents were this church, and blah, 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 it's my parents' religion. It can't be that. It has to be yours. So that torch has, you have to actively be teaching your children, make it personal, make it your, rather than you saying, you need to do this, in, encourage your child, um, whether they're a grown or, or young, Go and talk to God about it. You pray about it because make it, give them opportunities, lead them back to the Lord because um, it's one thing for us to grab this concept and to run with it. It's another thing for it to be a baton race. And I'm not telling us to sprint. I'm telling us to make it a baton race that from generation to generation we pass a baton and they run with it with the same intensity that I'm talking about now. Thank you for listening to the Life and Faith Podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please consider subscribing, leaving a review on your favorite platform, and sharing it with friends and family. Your support helps us continue spreading the gospel of faith, hope, and love. Connect with us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and many others to stay updated on our latest episodes. See the link in the show notes for all our social media channels. And until next time, it is our hope you'll commit yourself to an even deeper life and faith.